Hi. I'm going to cover the part B of uh, the unit three, which is which talks about software development lifecycle. In this part, we're just going to uh, get an overview of what software development lifecycle is all about. In the second part, we're going to cover some of the some of the most popular uh, software development lifecycles. So before we jump into software development lifecycle and the different approaches to it, let's get a sense of how complex is the software. And I'll explain why this is important. Well, this is complex, right? This definitely is complex, right? This uh, is the metro or the subway uh, route of Tokyo, Japan. And this is uh, similar to how complicated your product or your code base can turn out to be, right? Uh, over the year of over the months and years of evolution, the code base, the original code base, which was very simple, which served just had uh, served just one function and had just a couple of features, uh, would be very small. But as it grows, you will keep on adding more and more modules, more and more features, which will eventually result into something way more complicated right so how is the how is the uh, uh, system or software's complexity measured it is measured in terms of lines of code number of classes number of modules module interconnections etc 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 time to understand and so many more right there are a lot of ways to look at this and that is why uh, you know that is why it is important to first grasp the notion of how complex your software is which will help you understand how fast you can actually go right how fast can you develop anything new as you proceed further you'll get more and more difficult to add new features because it will add it will add some more complexity which can result into um, certain other features getting um, uh, certain other features getting affected right so now let me just introduce you a couple of very interesting approaches. So for example, ad hoc development, right? Which is great. I mean, if you are a coder, you can just simply start. Why do you have to prepare for anything? You can simply jump in and start coding, right? So you do not follow any formal guidelines or a process and you just simply jump in. What is the advantage? It's very easy to learn and use. And the disadvantage, you will, you will end up ignoring some important tasks because uh, you might directly jump in and you do not test it thoroughly. You're not completely clear when to start or stop during each task. It scales poorly to multiple people because it this was just one person. There's a good chance that you have not documented very well. Or if uh, you are stuck and you or you want to speed up the process and you want to add more people, it's very difficult to actually add somebody else and explain him the entire code and so on. Right? There's a good chance that the code may not match users' need also because you have not taken you have not do formally documented any kind of requirements, right? And there's a good chance the code was not planned for modification. Unless you are an expert, expert coder, perhaps you have taken care of modification and uh, uh, and evolution. Uh, but there's a good chance that you still would have missed out, right? So if you look at it, is any uh, software engineering project? I mean, end of the day, any product development that you're talking about will ultimately be can be broken down into smaller projects. The software engineering projects usually live with a fixed financial budget, right? Maintenance is an exception, perhaps, uh, like as in maintaining a certain code base, certain project already developed. Uh, but let's keep maintenance aside. So software engineering projects usually live with a fixed financial budget. Additionally, time to market places a strong time constraint because you definitely want to get uh, get to the market in a certain time frame, right? And there can be other project constraints such as staff. How many people can you actually use? So project planning is the art of scheduling the necessary activities in time, space, and across staff in order to optimize few things. Project risk, you want to keep risk very low. Profit, you want to keep the profit very high. Customer satisfaction, you want to keep that high. Worker satisfaction, so engineer, designer, product manager, everybody is happy. And finally, the long-term company goals, you want to make sure that you are meeting them, right? 
And that is why it's very important to understand the model involved behind software development lifecycle, which can meet the requirements of your current company, current project, and current engineers, the way they work, and so on. Right? So when you're planning with models, that is, uh, which model should you be using for developing your product, um, broadly, all of them can be broken down into three models. Okay, there's value-driven model, there's plan-driven, and there's formal methods. Okay. Uh, these are very, I would say, commonsensical once you read about, read them, once you have understood it. Uh, but if you have not seen it or, or if you don't think it from this lens, it, there's a good chance you might miss it and you might not realize what works when. So value-driven methods typically are great for low criticality or the, the project that you're working on is not a very high critical, very uh, highly critical project. It typically works very well with senior developers because you know they they can self organize they can they can work by themselves right so you don't have to give them a lot of plan to work with and typically requirements change very often in the value driven methods correct so i guess you might you might be aware of agile methodology so that agile methodology works beautifully well when there are senior developers and their requirements change often because then they can use their experience in actually building the right stuff. But when they're junior developers, it's actually much better to have a much better plan in process in, in place, right? Uh, but anyway, value-driven methods also work very well with small number of developers. And that's why uh, a lot of companies divide the engineers into smaller pods and they will work on smaller products within the large uh, interface, right? Uh, Plan-driven methods, in in contrast, they work great with uh, uh, when there's a high criticality. You know, it's like for example, banking app, or let's say it's anywhere where uh, the requirement or uh, a mistake can lead to major loss. Uh, Plan-driven methods are okay with junior developers. I mean, ideally, you would always want a senior developer, but uh, plan driven methods because it's planned and everything then and you want to follow a certain structure and you will typically have a senior developer to overlook everything uh, it works fine with junior developers as well and requirements do not change very often so it will change once in a month once in maybe a couple of months uh, and it works fine with large number of developers as well and that's why you would see that uh, in services companies uh, you will have a large pool of developers working in a very planned systematic manner right and you you need a culture that demands order. You want everybody to follow your instructions or follow the instructions uh, that has been laid out. And finally, there are formal methods which are extreme criticality, like shooting a rocket in the sky, right? Or self-driving car automation, right? You, these are extreme criticality, and you want really senior developers um, who follow this, correct? Uh, the requirements are very limited and limited features. Uh, there's a link attached, I think you should check that out. And the requirements that can be modeled, that's another very important thing, right? Uh, and the expectation is of extreme quality. So these are the different category of models that exist. Uh, which model exists in what? I think that will be revealed very soon. So a project plan, uh, when you're planning with models and you're, you're creating a project, a project plan contains much information, but must at least describe the resources needed, that is the people, money, equipment, etc. Dependency and timing of work. So what is the flow graph and so on? What is the rate of delivery? What do you want? Do you want reports and code base every week or every two months or how do you want it to work? Right. Otherwise, it will be impossible to measure the rate of progress. In addition to project members, the following may need access to parts of the project plan or the, the work that you're working on. It could be the management, it could be the customers, it could be suppliers, it could be investors, it could be even banks, for example. Right? Uh, so it is now compared to a let's say a a project of setting up a factory versus building a building a software. Uh, a factory can be seen, you know, it, it, you can see the progress made in a software, in a, in a factory setup, right? A foundation has been laid, some extra, more work has happened. But in the software, it is very difficult to monitor because uh, the software project cannot be seen, you know, 
unless and until most of the software has been built, it's very difficult to exactly see what has happened. You can see some code lines and things have, that have been worked, that have been written, but that doesn't lead to a, a, a working software till a, till a lot of software has been written. As compared to that, factories, you can easily see what, ha what progress has been seen, where you can easily see it. And that is why software engineering projects, that is the kind of project that you'll be working on, must produce additional deliverables, which are visible, such as design documents or prototypes, reports, project status meetings, or client service. You have to produce all of these additional uh, content uh, or uh, artifacts which can signify, which can help your stakeholders like the management, the customers, suppliers, etc., uh, to know where the progress is. Right? So, what is a software uh, life cycle? Well, it's a series of steps in a very simple term. It's a series of steps or phases through which software is produced from conception to end of life. And it can take months or years to complete, depending on what you're working on. Right. It's, 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 it's essentially a standardized format for planning, organizing and running a new development project. OK, now your entire product will ultimately be broken down into weeks of work, correct? Weeks and few months of work. And a project essentially is one of those well-defined sprints or uh, release cycles which you're following. OK. So it provides a fixed generic framework that can be tailored to a specific project. Project specific parameters will include size, that is a number of, that is for example, person years, budget, the duration. Hundreds of different kinds of models are known and used. Okay, many are minor variations or just a small number of basic models. I'll, expl I'll get to that in the part two, right? Now, when you're going through the multiple stages and steps and phases of uh, uh, software development, the goal of each phase marks out a clear set of steps to perform. It produces a tangible item, so you know exactly what is getting produced. It allows for a review of work. You want somebody to test it out. That's why there is a whole profession called QAs, uh, quality analysts. So and it specifies the goals, specify the actions to perform in the next phase. So this is what we have produced. This is about how you can test it out. And this is what needs to be done in the next phase. That is the entire goal. And life cycle stages, the, the one which I just spoke about, uh, virtually all life cycles, which I will cover up, uh, share these steps for sure. There's a requirements phase where you are gathering requirements. Then there's a design phase where you design the solution. Uh, then there's an implementation phase where you implement the solution. Finally, you test the solution. And finally, you end up maintaining the solution. The crux of the problem is, how do you combine them and in what order? How do you combine these five different steps and in what order? That is essentially the crux of uh, various software development lifecycle methods that exist. Right? Some of the most popular lifecycle methods are um, code and fix, where you code something, you you test it on the uh, test it out in the market, or you just simply test it. You debug it and repeat it. So it's very ad hoc, right? Which is great if there's one single developer and you just want to crack out something um, something urgently. It's it works fine. Uh, then there's waterfall where it's a standard phases. You go in one sequential order. Then there's a spiral where you simply assess risks at each step. You do something. You assess. Uh, so you um, Identify the problem, you identify the biggest risk involved, you solve for that. Then you go to the next step, then you go to the next step, and you keep on doing the right, the, the riskiest things again and again, and uh, you end up having a spiral. Then you have evolutionary prototyping, where you build something very small, uh, you uh, build something pertaining to a very small requirement spec, you code it, and then evolve to the next step. Right? This sounds very similar to agile, but uh, slightly different and then stage delivery where you have uh, initial requirements uh, specs for several releases then design and code each in sequence so you you have a large project in mind or large product in mind and you have divided it into multiple phases and you are uh, you have a very clear stage delivery so stage delivery used to happen uh, very frequently for uh, you know desktop apps it, it happens even now where the entire or for example large critical application like android 
the Android OS itself. There's a very clear stage delivery that happens. So this is what we're going to produce. We will produce in three months, in six months, in nine months, and so on. Right? Now, why do you need this? Why do you need a process? Why do you need a software development lifecycle model and uh, system in place? Very simply because if you do not have a process, uh, in the beginning of the project, the percentage of effort might be very small, right? And I mean, the process driven thing would be very small in the beginning, as you can see here. And uh, as you can see here, the in the beginning, the big, uh, the process driven work would be very small and you're doing a lot of thrashing, you're doing low, heavy duty thrashing. As you go along, the process is, is setting up and the process is, is being put up. But there's a lot of thrashing involved because you just simply have to end the project. And usually end of the project, it becomes very, very difficult to manage, right? But, and as you can see, the productive work is only decreasing from here. See, the white space, correct? As compared to that, if there's a process, there's a good chance that the beginning of project, you, you have a very clearly well-defined process and the effort taken to uh, implement and run through the process is going to be, uh, is only going to decline while the thrashing is within certain threshold. And that's where the productive work will be much better, right? So to conclude, software development lifecycle uh, comes in various shapes and sizes and there's no one fixed um, silver bullet that depends on what product are you working on, what project you're working on, who are the people you're working, junior, senior, what's the criticality of the uh, of what you're working on. Uh, and that is why you need to figure out which or what tweak of an existing software development lifecycle will work best for you. In the next part, we will we're going to cover the several different software development lifecycle methods that exist. Um, and I think that will help you clarify this part one as well. See you, see you in the next session.